praise the Lord. Amen. We're glad to be in the house of God this morning. Thank you so much for being with us, those that are in-house and those that have joined us on Live Feet of Light. We do have several that are out of town, uh, on the road traveling uh, this weekend, uh, so we want to be praying for them. And we also have some that are homesick, uh, that uh, actually do have one family that's homesick with COVID, uh, so we want to be much in prayer for them. No, not been around anybody. Uh, so we want to, but we do want to keep, keep them in our prayers. If you have a prayer request, let it be known by lifting your hand. God knows every need. Let's all stand, those that are able. If you're on live feed and you have a prayer request, text the keyword prayer to 205-642-8744. We do want to partner together in prayer. I know my God is able. Amen. Amen. Whatever the needs are in our lives, God is able. Able. Amen. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, I want to thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for this great opportunity, this wonderful opportunity you've allowed us to come into your house to worship and praise you. Father, today I pray that you'll move and minister to the hearts and lives of each one, those that are in-house, those that are on live feet alike. You've seen the uplifting of the hands. You've seen the text messages. You've seen those, every person that has a need in their life. And Father, I pray that as we lay those down at the foot of the cross, I ask you to move in a mighty way. Touch and minister in this service, each one that's here, each one that's on live feed. Father, I pray that you'll touch and minister to every heart and every life that's represented. We pray we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise and let's worship this morning. Amen. Yes, amen. Let's worship him in song this morning. Let's sing to him by loving kindness.
Thank you, Jesus. Worship him this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, 
clap of praise as you're being seated this morning. God is good. Amen. 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 Glory be to God. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today. Again, thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for this great opportunity that you've allowed us to come into your house to worship and praise you. Father, I, I pray today that you'll just continue to move out this service. I pray you'll touch the hearts and lives of each one that's here today. We forever give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Again, we appreciate you being in the house of God today. Amen. If you'll notice, the screens are off. Lightning, lightning has hit, and we're working on getting some repairs done. 
uh, that should be done this week. We're, we've got a couple of things we need to do up in, up in the attic area behind that TV there. So old-fashioned way, get your Bibles. I can't say old-fashioned way if I say get your electronic Bibles out, can I? You have to get your Bibles. There's a pew Bible right there in front of you, or you can grab, you've got a Bible. If you've got your phone, you've got a Bible on there. You can turn, your, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 20. As you're turning there, I want us to realize in something and, and understand something. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I know last Sunday we had uh, Brother John Davis uh, John David Booth was in service with us, wonderful service. Uh, but a couple of Sundays before that, picking back up with that, we're talking about the title of this, if you want to call this a sermon series, is Living What We Believe. In order to live a life of a Christian, we've got to understand what we believe in. You cannot just say, I'm a Christian, without a knowledge of what that means or what that entails. If I walked around and said that I was a, a, a mechanic, we all know I'm not, we all want to walk around and say I'm a mechanic, then I've got to have an understanding of what that actually entails. People say that, uh, you, uh, that it's going to take a, ro a rocket scientist to figure that out. And we say that, we don't really understand maybe what a rocket scientist actually does or what they actually do. Uh, if, you, if you was to say... Um, uh, an economist, what do they actually do? What, do they, what, what does their life actually entail? What's their job actually entail? Uh, a legal secretary, what does their job actually entail? And so there's things about life that we, we got to understand what those actual entailment of those processes and that job actually is. Well, as a Christian, we must understand we need to understand, we need to realize what, we, what it is to be a Christian and what that actually entails. And that's what we've been looking at. In order to live a life as a Christian, what do we have to do? What do we have to actually do in our lives to be a Christian? There are many that I know that they can quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. There's sections of the Bible they could quote it word for word. They could detail you and give you everything. But do they actually live what they believe? They might understand the aspects of the scripture. They might can quote you the story out of the Bible whenever a man by the name of Abraham is going up onto a mountaintop and he has his son Isaac toting firewood. And Isaac looks at daddy and says, Dad... Here's the firewood, there's the fire, but where's the sacrifice? They might could actually quote you those scriptures, but do they actually believe and live what those scriptures actually entail? There is a difference. Amen? You can tell the story of Daniel and the, Daniel and the lion's den, how that the king looked in the next morning and Daniel is laying there sound asleep with the lion right beside him thinking that the king's going to look in and he's going to see Daniel all eat up and mauled and dead. But he actually looks in and sees Daniel peacefully asleep. You can quote that out of Scripture, but do you really know what it actually means? Those are the things that we need to really take a hold of and look at for our lives. But if you take a look at Matthew chapter 28, you read verses 18 through 20. This is a part of the foundation of where we as Christians need to realize what we believe. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, it says, And Jesus said unto them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me, unto Jesus. He's telling the disciples and he's telling those that was there and he's telling you and I, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So we need to understand what the make disciples actually means. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is how Jesus told to baptize. What is he saying? He's saying make disciples. What does this mean? He means spread the good news of Jesus Christ. 
Spread the good news of the plan of salvation. That is what Jesus came to earth for, is the plan of salvation. He's telling them to teach them and to be disciples. He's telling them to disciple them. In other words, he's telling them, hey, I want you to teach them. I want you to show them. I want you to live an example in front of them and show them what it is to be a Christian. He's telling them to disciple people. To disciple somebody does not mean here's the book and read it for yourself. We can't do that. As much as the Bible is, is the most purchased book in the entire globe, on the entire globe, as much as that is, there are still many that have never opened up the Bible. There's people that owns probably a dozen Bibles, but those same folks will ask, when is God going to speak to me? And they haven't opened up their Bible in months. How can God speak if you never open His Word? This is what it means to make a disciple. It's not just showing them a book and say, read it for yourself and learn. No, being, making disciples means showing them the book, but actually living it out and teaching what it is to be a Christian. That's what our job entails. That's what we're supposed to do. Many times in the church world, and we've talked about this some on Wednesday night, many times in the church world, all you get is criticism and downplay and everything else about oh, of what this is or what that is or how somebody looks or how somebody parted the hair and somebody gets mad over the fact that the preacher didn't wear a yellow shirt today. People get mad over the silliest of things. They'll blame it on the church hurt me, the church did this, the church did that. And I get it. I understand the church is full of hurt. The church is full of hurting people. The church is full of hurting people and hurt people hurt people. But I didn't come to church to see you. I came to church to worship God. And I'm going to tell you something, church. The church house is the best place for hurt people to be to receive a healing from God. I've had people to tell me, they'll say, I can't go back to church because the church is full of hypocrites. You know what I tell them? The church has room for one more. What we must realize and understand is coming to the house of God is not about a social gathering. Coming here is about learning about who Jesus Christ is about what the plan of salvation is and how that affects our lives. Jesus said, I have all authority been given unto him by whom? By God. God created the heavens and the earth and everything that we've got. And God gave authority unto Jesus Christ. But the scripture goes on and tells us. He tells us that Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And Jesus goes on and says, I am with you always until the end of the age. What we've got to realize and understand, I, look, before I even say that, I want to ask you something. I want every perfect person that has no sin in their life at the current time, I want every perfect person to raise your hand. None of us are perfect. We all have failures. My biggest one, I can't match a thing. I have to get approval to go out of the house. I cannot believe you're wearing a black sock. Or black socks with that outfit. No, I've got brown socks on. I promise you, I, I do, I do. I should have wore black socks today right now just for that. I didn't because I'd have been in trouble. None of us are perfect. And it goes much deeper than the fact that we can't, that we can't match things. It goes deeper than that. 
We all have failures. We all have shortcomings. Many have, don't point to nobody, Jesus, help us, don't point to nobody. Many have short tempers. Don't point to nobody. Wives, don't point to nobody. Husbands, you better put your hand back down. Some's going to be in trouble after this. What we've got to realize is we all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's the book of Romans. Romans tells us that. But what we must realize is that we have an advocate with the Father when we fail, when we fall short, when we stumble, when we, when we mess up. We're going to mess up. I, I, I said in a sermon one time, I was sitting there on a pew, and, the, and, the, and, and if, I, if I didn't know any better, if I was just listening and just absorbing everything in, if I didn't know any better, I would have left that church thinking, man, once I get saved, I'm perfect. That's the biggest lie from the pits of hell. But I'm going to tell you something. Once you get saved, there's got, this is, this is no exception to this. Hello, I need you to hear me. There's no exception to this. Once you get saved, there must be a life-changing aspect of your life. Things have to be different. Brother Andy, where is that in the Bible? The Bible tells, tells us old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you know what becomes new? Y'all, this ain't even an outline. I'm glad you ain't looking at it. You know what becomes new? Attitudes become new. Actions become new. Vocabulary becomes new. The things we do becomes new. The way, the way we live our life becomes new. I cannot understand, and I do not, I can't figure that, I cannot fathom this. When Christians will say, the devil made me do it. Come on! That ain't even biblical. What we must realize and understand, God has given all authority and power unto Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do? He has, he has exerted that to the Holy Spirit that can live in our lives today. The Bible tells us, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. So let, several things that we've looked at Several things that we've looked at on knowing what it is to be a Christian, how to live a life as a Christian. Just to really briefly run back through a couple of those. First of all, the Word of God is the Word of God, period. No question to ask. The Bible is the final Word of God. God has said it. It's been penned. It's been inspired. It's been written into the book. It's there. We believe the truths of the Word of God. That's it. There's nothing else. You cannot add to the Scripture. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, the very last chapter, the very last few verses, anyone adds, lightning's going to come down from heaven and strike you. <laughs> it doesn't say that, but that's what I've always felt like. You add to the Scripture, the things that's written in the book will be added unto your life. That's what the script, that's what, that is what the Bible says. What we've got to realize and understand is when God says something, you take that to the bank and know that God means business. God tells us in His Word, He wants all men to be saved. So you know what that tells me? How many, I've got family that is not saved. I've got family that if they was to die today, they would go to hell. The Bible says that Jesus came that all man would have redemption for the, to the Father. Guess what that tells me? All man has a chance for salvation. God doesn't want anybody to die not saved. We must understand and realize the Bible has been inspired and has been breathed by the very Holy Spirit of God. In, in uh, 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it tells us that all Scripture has been breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof. It is profitable for correction, training in righteousness. So we must understand that because the Word of God has been given from God to man, 
We use the scripture to change our lives. Many people are looking for all sorts of things to change their lives. They look for a change in their life. They look at a bottle. They look at drugs. They look at nicotine. They look at any addiction that, that man can have. I want to tell you something. Addiction goes further than just drugs and alcohol. Addiction is so many other things. But people will look at all of those things trying to find a pl something to fill the void. But I want to tell you something. The Word of God has been given to fill that void in our lives. I know people that have done... That, I've never done drugs. I can't tell you what that is. I can't tell you how, that, how it affects the life. I don't, I don't know anything about that. But I, I, know, I know people that has done drugs. I know people that, is, that has been addicted to anything on earth. And they'll come back and once they've gotten saved, they'll say, I wonder how I lived under that addiction. I wonder how my life functioned under that. How did I live without Jesus in my heart? You think back, every, every Christian thinks back over the time when they got saved and they look back at that and they're like, my life was so much different the day before. Think about the day before. Everybody, everybody talks about the day you got saved, but I want you to think back of the day before you got saved. Boy, the weight. Boy, the struggles. Boy, the trials. Boy, the worries and the circumstances that you faced. And then there came that day, whether it was in an altar in a church house, whether it was in a, by a hay bale in the barn, whether it was in your, in your bathroom, in your living room, in the car going down the street, wherever the case might have been, that, that person cried out and said, I need forgiveness. Oh, what a weight that was lifted. Oh, what a difference their life made after. They got saved. Do you know what I've had? I'm going to tell you. Look, look, I want you to hear this. I've had folks that are not saved. They'll tell me there is the silliest thing they've ever heard that just saying a few little words would change somebody's life. That is a silly thing. And I'll, I'll say this. Well, why don't you try it and see if it's real? No, I don't want to give up my life. I don't want to give up the things in my life. God wants so much more for us. When we talk about the Bible being the very inspiration of the breath of God, we're talking about all the blessings in the Word of God. Amen? God tells us in His Word, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor my seed begging for bread. I want to tell you something. God says He's going to help take care of His children. God says He takes care of His own. The things that's going on in our lives, things that's happening, the price of gas, the price of groceries, the price of milk, the price of bread, God says he's going to take care of his children. Brother Andy, what about my health? God says he's his, he is the great physician. I've been in many hospital rooms. I've been in many, many, in the waiting room of many folks that's going to have surgery. I've been in many ICU rooms. I've been in many ICU rooms where the doctor has tell, told me and the family. I happened to be there when the doctor would be there and come in and tell the family. Basically, there's no hope. You don't believe me, it'll happen. Talk to that man right over there. Matter of fact, matter of fact talk to his wife. He was asleep during that time. I'm telling you, God says, I've got the last word. God said he'd bring healing in our lives, and I'm going to tell you something. Many times people will look for a healing on this side of Jordan, but there's also the other side. Oh, Brother Andy, death is not a healing. Death is a healing for a Christian. I've been at the bedside of many that have suffered and suffered through sickness before death. But once they took that last breath, it was a time of rejoicing because I knew where they was going. That is the inspiration and the inspiredness of the Word of God. The Word of God tells us 3,800 times the phrase, the Lord said. 
That's pronouncing blessings on us. The Lord said, you are the head and not the tail. The Lord said, you are victorious over the trials in this life. The Lord said, you can be healed. You can be redeemed. You can be set free. The Lord says these things, so why not take those in to our lives? We also know that in the Word of God, I laid that little bit of a foundation to bring us to this point. The Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know why this particular avenue has just laid heavy on my heart today. I don't know. I pray that, I pray that this touches somebody's heart. But I want you to look at Romans chapter 3. I'm going to go slow because I know you got to turn. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 through 12. I told the sound booth this morning, I said, I just left some spaces for some verses because I really don't know the route this is going this morning. I didn't fully know until I walked up to the pulpit. Somebody says, well, that's just, that's just playing it by ear. No, I'm playing it by God. I'm going to tell you right now. This is for somebody. Romans 3, starting in verse 10. We've just, we've just told you how that the Word of God has been inspired by the very breath of God. Whatever the Bible says is factual. There's been many times that I've walked into meetings and I've walked into situations, I've walked into circumstances. Brother Emery, I've always said, people will tell me a lot of things and then I've always said, but wait a minute, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's written down? What's on paper? What's been written down and what's been signed? What's a document? Show me on paper. People can tell me a whole lot of stuff. There was somebody just here recently. I've asked, I asked for some information, and they said, this is the information. I immediately responded with, where is the documentation? It took eight weeks for me to get the documentation. And for those that knows me very well, knows I was not a happy camper. I don't, I don't, I really don't have that much patience. I really don't. I can pretend like I do, but I really don't. I don't have that much patience. When the documentation came, guess what? Documentation shows something totally different than what was said. So I can tell you a lot of things, but until you see it written in the Word of God, that's where it needs to come to life in your lives. Romans tells us, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good. No, not even one. What is this telling us? What is this talking about? What is this, what is this laying out before us? Well, first of all, this is a part of the plan of salvation. What? How can that be part of the plan of salvation? When this is saying, no one does good. No one is righteous. How is that a part of the plan of salvation? That is describing what man is apart from God. No one's righteous. No one's holy. No one's worthy. No one's done good. No one. Apart from God, we're worthless. I'm worth nothing. I have no value to me. Do you know how many times I have sat in this building at somewhere, whether it be here, it be in the office, be in the prayer room, sat in the chair right here, 
talking with somebody. I've talked with young people. I've talked with teenagers. I've talked with young adults. Do you know how many times somebody will say, I am not worthy. No one loves me. I can't do right by anybody. Let me tell you something. I tell them and I tell you the same thing. There's somebody that does love you, and that is God. But in our own self, just in who we are, we do not have the righteousness of God. The Bible tells us our righteousness is as filthy rags. We cannot do good. But salvation, as it comes into our lives, it has a divine and a human component to salvation. Salvation has a divine, a spiritual component, and it has a human component, a physical component. On the spiritual side, God sent His Son into the world to die on the cross for one person. And that was me. For one person, that was you. If there was only one person, Jesus died for that person. Jesus' blood was enough for all of mankind, all of humanity. Jesus came into this world to have a sacrificial life, to die on a cross of Calvary, and to be raised again on the third day, and to sit on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. That is why Jesus came. That is the plan of salvation. Mankind twists it. Mankind makes it complicated. Mankind makes it, makes it hard. But I want to tell you something, church. There's nothing hard about the plan of salvation. God, here I am. I am a sinner. I need you as my Lord and Savior. Bam! That's all it takes. Mankind makes it complicated. But on the spiritual side of salvation, that is why Jesus came. On the human side, on the physical side, our sinfulness has ruined our relationship with God. And that's why we need salvation in the first place. God sent Adam and Eve into a garden where all was perfect. God gave them one command and one command only. Do not eat of the tree of life. The little serpent come along. This is just like the devil today. He whispers in the ears of all mankind. Some, even this morning, I'm sure. Don't you wish this guy would hush so you can go to the restaurant? So you can get something good to eat? That's what's being whispered into, into mankind right now. Don't tell me it ain't. I ain't got my glasses on, but I hear you chuckle. I, look, I could see the smiles on the faces. I know that's what happens. I know that's what takes place. The serpent, more, more subtle, more guile than any person ever. The devil can slither around. Do you know why? He sneaks around like a roaring lion whom he can devour because he tries to mimic who God is. God and Jesus Christ, the, the Holy Spirit of God, that is the line of the tribe of Judah. But the devil, he tries to mimic who God is. He, tell, he whispers in your ear and says, this guy has no clue what he's talking about. This guy is blowing hot air and he ain't got a clue what's going on in your life. Nope, I sure don't. I don't have a clue what's going on in your life. I don't know the hardship. I don't know the problems. I don't know the things that you're facing. But God does. If God can save me, he can save anybody. Brother Andy, you didn't do nothing bad. Nope, God kept me from a lot of that stuff. That's still a very powerful God. Because those things was right in front of me growing up all of my life. 
it would have been easy for me as a 14, 15 year old to have opened up a beer and to drunk it and nobody would have known it. That would have been very easy. I had access to it. It would have been easy for me to start dipping skull snuff. It would have been very easy for me to get my hands on cigarettes. It would have been easy for me to get my hands on drugs. God kept me from those things. But Brother Andy, you don't understand. God didn't keep me from that. Nope, but God can save you from that. I'm not being ugly. I'm presenting to you an alternative to what the devil has offered. And I'm going to tell you something. The devil's going to lie to you all day long. If the devil was to tell you right now it's sun shining outside, you better go check. Does anybody know anybody like that? Never mind, don't raise your hand. Don't point to nobody. It's important that we understand the sinfulness, the universal sinfulness of, sinfulness of humanity. The first step in receiving salvation is the knowledge we have offended God and we're separated from God because of that sin. You're not separated from God because of this or because of this or because of this. You're separated from God because of the choices that's been made in our lives. Our choices have consequences. Our choices do matter. We must realize we've got to make better choices. We've got to make choices that line up with the Holy Spirit of God. We've got to make choices that line up with the Word of God. We've got to make choices that gets us closer to God. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It's a true statement. This can be trusted, and the message is, is worthy of everyone accepting it. Not a single person should reject. Not a single person should ignore the message. Why? Because Paul said, I'm going to close right here. I've got one more statement that I need to, I'm going to read. I've got one more verse I'm going to read to you and then I'm going to close. God is wanting to do something in people's lives if we would just let him. We have to make a choice to allow God to break the sin, the chains of bondage that's dragging us down. Whatever is going on, Whatever is happening, that is what God is wanting to fix in our lives. Uh, just say the name of Jesus. Can y'all come and get, I just threw that one at you. Y'all might not have it, the, 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 the music to it. I want you to understand something. All you have to do is say the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is so powerful. The name of Jesus is so awesome. The name of Jesus is so wonderful. There is coming a time that the very name of Jesus is going to be spoken by every atheist on planet earth. And they're going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. I want to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord before I'm forced and made to. My last thought. Jesus Christ has saved the chief of all sinners. There was a man by the name of Saul that persecuted and, and ridiculed and beat Christians. This man by the name of Saul, his name was changed to Paul. He said, I am the chief sinner. 
Paul persecuted believers. He tried to annihilate Christians off of earth. He injured believers. He brutalized believers. He violently was against believers. And he enjoyed what he did. Jesus saved a man by the name of Paul. Showed a pattern. Very simply, if Paul can be saved, anyone can be saved. I want you to stand all over this house this morning. Live feet, thank you so much for being with us. May God bless you.